Good morning, everyone. At least it's morning where I am. Today we're going to cross over the Atlantic Ocean and consider Christianity in colonial America. Now, before we begin, I must admit that I am overlooking a significant portion of Christianity in America, and that is the settlement of the Southwest United States by Catholic nations such as Spain and Portugal. And so Catholicism was quite strong uh, in the Southwest, and Dominicans and Franciscans uh, brought the gospel and established missions uh, all through uh, that, that area uh, up the western coast as well. But we're going to focus on the American colonies on the eastern seaboard because that's where most of the influence is going to be felt on the early American nation. So let's look at colonial American Christianity. Uh, you see the Puritans uh, landing on the coast and establishing uh, new communities in the new world. Let's talk about the Plymouth Plantation. Uh, as we have discussed, in the 16th century, English separatists were persecuted by the Church of England. And there was uh, a congregation in Gainsborough led by our very own Baptist John Smith. Uh, that is, he was a Baptist later on. Uh, but uh, that congregation uh, became too large to avoid detection. And so they divided the congregation. The second congregation was led by William Brewster, William Bradford, and Pastor John Robinson. They organized in Scrooby Manor uh, in England, but because of uh, persecution, they evacuated to uh, Leiden, Netherlands. And from there, they boarded the Mayflower, headed to the New World. And so we know this group as the Mayflower Pilgrims. In 1620, they landed in Massachusetts. They had been heading for Virginia, uh, but uh, they were blown northward, and they landed in Massachusetts and founded the Plymouth Plantation. Their chronicler was William Bradford, and he referred to these settlers as pilgrims, and thus they are known today. Before disembarking from the ship, the pilgrims uh, signed the Mayflower Contract, and they agreed that they undertook this venture for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country. So we see that they perceived their uh, endeavor as a uh, religious mission as well as a, uh, a, a, a secular pursuit for uh, land and security. Well, not very secure. Uh, in the first winter that was so severe that half of the pilgrims died. Uh, they would not have survived if it had not been for the Native Americans who uh, taught them how to, uh, to, uh, to plant and to uh, uh, stay warm. They helped them build shelters. Uh, but in later years, the small colony prospered and with their newfound religious liberty set up a congregational church. As we will see, this newfound religious liberty applied only to the Puritans themselves. Uh, we will see that uh, they did not extend this religious liberty to others, but that is a story for just a few minutes later. In 1691, the Plymouth Plantation merged into the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was uh, the larger and uh, more powerful and uh, more uh, consequential um, settlement. But uh, first we want to talk about the first Thanksgiving in 1621. I commented that uh, the pilgrims would not have survived without the help of the Native Americans. And so uh, the following harvest, 
uh, led to the first Thanksgiving in 1621, and you're familiar with this story. All right, let's talk about the <clears throat> Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1629, uh, the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Company was granted an independent charter. This is amazing. It allowed virtual self-government and religious freedom in New England. And so they were um, uh, excused uh, from the uh, necessary allegiance to the Church of England that they had labored under and been persecuted by uh, in England. And so this was an amazing opportunity for the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony to have religious freedom, to, to live, to make laws, to worship, uh, and to gather together in freedom from the, uh, the oppression, the suppression, and all of the uh, religious laws of the Claritin Code that governed uh, worship in England. But instead of religious freedom for all, the Puritans united the Congregational Church with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So even in the New World, there's a union of church and state. And this state church was intolerant of any dissent, even uh, intolerant of uh, Anglicans. So this is a role reversal. Uh, the Puritans now began to uh, suppress uh, the Church of England. They also persecuted Baptists, Quakers, and any other dissenters in their territory. And so Puritan Congregationalism became the established church in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. This is an important consideration for us as we go forward to talk about American Christianity. Now the Puritan Governor John Winthrop called uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony a city upon a hill and declared that all eyes are upon us. The expectation was that this community with God's laws enacted as uh, the, the civil laws uh, with a, a community that was uh, 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 populated by committed Christians, that this would be an amazing uh, community uh, whose, whose uh, uh, glory and honor would spread throughout the world, would be an example, and would be this city upon a hill for all to see. He said, all eyes are upon us and watching us. Well, this phrase, city upon a hill, uh, was revived by Ronald Reagan and is a concept that we're familiar with uh, today. This was called the New England Way. Puritans were Calvinistic in their theology. Uh, nonetheless, early Puritans put a stress on relating an experience of conversion as prerequisite to full church membership. All right, so the Calvinistic Puritans continued to uh, practice infant baptism, but that infant baptism was not enough uh, to uh, provide full church membership. Every person, every citizen, uh, must confess a personal conversion before the congregation. Uh, and if they uh, claimed that they had experienced God's saving grace, then they could be in full communion with the church. Only men in full communion had a role in the colony's public life, and only they could vote. Now, as you can imagine, not every person in the community was able to give testimony to a personal conversion. And so without that testimony, uh, that person could not be a full citizen 
Well, what happened when uh, these unfulfilled uh, men and women married and have children? Uh, should those uh, children be baptized into the church? Well, of course, the church did not want to refuse baptism uh, to any children, and so they instituted the halfway covenant. You will want to remember uh, the halfway covenant and what it means. It was instituted in 1662, and it provided uh, for the children of second generation Puritans uh, to bring their children for baptism. These children then uh, could receive halfway membership. So they were included in the life of the church, but they could not participate in the Lord's Supper unless they themselves uh, made a confession of faith. So generations grew up without confirming their baptism, and so they became unregenerate members of the covenant community. There were members of the community who had not been born again and had not confessed a conversion experience. And so the halfway covenant was a step away from the Puritan ideals for their city upon a hill. I blame the problems of the halfway covenant and this unregenerate membership on the institution of infant baptism. If they conducted baptism biblically, then every member who made a confession of faith would be baptized as a believer, and at that point then, they would become members of the church. But uh, as Calvinists, uh, as uh, Puritans, uh, having this, uh, this long uh, tradition of infant baptism, they maintained this practice to the detriment of their church. Now, we'll talk about the Salem Witch Trials. These started in 1692, and the Witch Trials of, of Salem Village left a permanent stain on the Puritan legacy. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in colonial Massachusetts uh, starting in early 1692 and concluding in mid-1693. But during this about eight month period, more than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft, the devil's magic, and 20 were executed. Now eventually the colony admitted the trials were a mistake and they compensated the families of those convicted. But the story begins in uh, January of 1692 when Reverend Paris's daughter Elizabeth, who was age nine, and the Reverend's niece, <clears throat> Abigail Williams, aged 11, they started having fits. All right, their actions are described as they screamed, <clears throat> they threw things, they uttered peculiar sounds, they contorted themselves into strange positions. The local doctor had no um, uh, uh, diagnosis, and so he blamed the supernatural. This must be the actions of evil spirits. There was an, a third girl uh, named Ann Putman, uh, also aged 11, and she experienced similar episodes. So in the next month, in February, under pressure from the magistrates, these girls blamed three women for afflicting them. One was a Caribbean slave. Uh, another was a homeless beggar woman. And um, uh, then the third was an elderly impoverished woman. So these three women were blamed for uh, uh, an alliance with the devil. Now, the two women, two of the women uh, denied any involvement. They claimed innocence, but the Caribbean slave confessed the slave, the, I'm sorry, the devil came to me and bid me serve him. And so all three women were put into jail. 
Uh, once the seed of paranoia was planted, a stream of accusations followed for the next uh, few months. Um, these witch trials were spurred on by hostility against a few lonely women, a few new families, uh, adolescent hysteria by a few teenage girls, and then there was judicial injustice by a few old men. Now, in May of 1692, so just a few months later, the governor ordered the establishment of a special court, and the first case brought to this court was uh, an older woman known for her gossipy habits and promiscuity, uh, but when she was asked if she committed witchcraft, she said, I am as innocent as the child unborn. But she was found guilty, and on June 10th, she became the first person hanged on what was later called Gallows Hill. Now, the respected minister Cotton Mather wrote a letter imploring the court uh, to uh, curb its, uh, its wild accusations and uh, capital punishment. Um, and then the governor uh, uh, responded to the plea and, you know, his own wife was questioned for witchcraft. And so he prohibited further arrests. He released many of the accused, dissolved the court, and eventually pardoned all who were in prison. But by May of 1693, the damage had been done. 19 had been hanged on Gallows Hill. One 71-year-old uh, man had been pressed to death with heavy stones. Uh, several people had died in jail. Nearly 200 people had been accused of practicing the devil's magic. So uh, as a result of the Salem witch trial, uh, 20 were executed. In modern times, uh, scientists have considered uh, the, uh, the symptoms and uh, the environment of the 17th century uh, Massachusetts, and the suggestion has been made that uh, there was a fungus that grew on wheats and grains in this, uh, this moist, humid area. And this fungus uh, can contaminate food and lead to muscle spasms, vomiting, delusions, and hallucinations. And so there all along was a uh, biological uh, a reason uh, for these, uh, these uh, contortions, and it certainly wasn't uh, supernatural evil spirits. So, uh, as I've said, the Salem witch trials are a blot on the memory of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. All right, let's talk about Roger Williams. You see his life dates there in the 17th century. Roger Williams was an English separatist, quite vocal. Uh, who rejected the Church of England. And because of his, uh, his uh, re rebellion, uh, he was threatened with imprisonment. And so he fled to America in 1631. Now, in America, <clears throat> he continued his um, rebellious uh, ways, and he accused uh, the Puritans there of having stolen the land from the Indians. He also criticized uh, their lack of, of uh, separatism uh, and, uh, uh, and, and pure living. And so as a result, uh, he was uh, put into prison in, uh, in, in uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. They uh, allowed him to continue his sentence in home arrest if he would keep his mouth shut, which of course he didn't. And uh, so they, uh, they threatened to uh, send him back to England. And so he fled, uh, he escaped, and, uh, and took refuge with the Narragansett Indians uh, that he had befriended. He said, I would rather live with the Christian savages 
of Narragansett than with the savage Christians of uh, Massachusetts. And so in June of 1636, he founded his own colony, which he named the Providence Colony in what is now Rhode Island. And in 1644, he traveled to London to establish a charter which would prevent the annexation of uh, the colony by Massachusetts Bay. The Providence Colony was founded on three principles, religious liberty, political democracy, and separation of church and state. So you can see how Roger Williams influenced the coming American constitution and a practice of religious liberty. Roger Williams, being a student of the Bible, uh, as did anyone who studied the Word of God related to baptism, he decided that uh, infant baptism was not biblical and he desired to practice believer's baptism. So on March 16, 1639, he founded uh, what became the first Baptist congregation in America. Now, without a baptized believer uh, to ad administer uh, baptism, he asked his layman, Ezekiel Holliman, to baptize him, and then Williams baptized the rest of the congregation, of whom there were 12 members. From the beginning, they practiced believer's baptism by immersion. However, Williams uh, began to question the validity of his baptism. Since he had not been baptized by a baptized believer, perhaps his baptism uh, was not valid. And so he actually remained a Baptist only four months and then became a seeker. And for the rest of his life, he looked for apostolic succession with genuine baptism, which he never found. Uh, bless his heart. And I'm reminded of John Smith, who had the same concerns about his self-baptism. Well, I am not as concerned as others are about baptismal succession. It sounds very much like the Catholic apostolic succession. But nonetheless, this is what happened to uh, Roger Williams. And uh, often he lived his life following the animistic, spiritualistic uh, practices of the Native Americans. And so even though Roger Williams is revered as the first Baptist in America, nonetheless, he adhered to the Baptist faith only for a short time. Notice the uh, steeple of this church. This is the, uh, the meeting house of the first Baptist church in Providence, Rhode Island. And notice the beautiful steeple. Well, if you've ever been on the New Orleans campus, you've seen the steeple of Level College, which is patterned after uh, the Providence steeple. Our uh, steeple is a little bit shorter because of the nearby airport, and you'll notice on the top of our steeple there's a flashing red light. But I've been to uh, Providence on a couple of different occasions, and I always tour uh, First Baptist Providence and uh, enjoy seeing it and the steeple. All right, Roger Williams uh, is also uh, uh, revered as uh, the first advocate for religious liberty in America. In 1644, he published The Bloody Tenant of Persecution, which was a plea for religious liberty, and he included examples of persecution. It was written against uh, John Cotton, the Congregationalist uh, pastor in Boston, and uh, Cotton replied with, the bloody tenant washed and made white by the blood of the lamb. Williams then uh, answered again with the bloody tenant yet more bloody. Okay, so we had this, this publication war going on about religious liberty. But, uh, but again, we are, 
we are indebted to Roger Williams as, uh, as a, uh, even as a part-time Baptist for being the first one to, uh, to advocate for religious liberty. So going all the way back to the Anabaptist, Balthazar Hubmeyer, who wrote On Heretics and Those Who Burned Them, A Plea for Religious Liberty. We go to England and we find Thomas Helwes, who wrote a Mystery of Iniquity, again, uh, pleading for religious liberty in the English language. And now in America, we have Roger Williams. And so the point I want to make is that throughout history, Baptists have been advocates for religious liberty. I would say that Baptists have made two major contributions to Christendom. One is believers' baptism by immersion, and the second is religious liberty. So, listing Roger Williams' contributions to the nation and to religious life, we recognize his mission to Indians, uh, the foundation of the first Baptist church in America, which still is functioning there in Providence, Rhode Island. He took a stand for religious liberty. He called for the separation of church from state, and he uh, established political democracy in his colony. Well, let's talk about John Clark. Very few of you will remember the advertising campaign by Avis, the car rental company, uh, they were always a second place to first place Hertz, but Avis's uh, campaign slogan was, uh, we're number two, we try harder. All right, John Clark was number two in many ways after Roger Williams, but he tried harder. He was more successful because he was more consistent. In 1638, John Clark started a colony in Newport, Rhode Island after purchasing land from the Indians. Like Roger Williams, he agreed that uh, the, uh, the Englanders couldn't just take that land. He became the pastor of Newport uh, Baptist Church. Now, at some point, uh, this, uh, this church became uh, Baptist between 1641 and 1648. The records are not clear, but nonetheless, this is the second Baptist congregation. The Newport Church was well organized and more stable than the Providence Church because of Clark's leadership. Now, there uh, is an amazing story uh, about the persecution of uh, these Newport Baptists. Uh, in the congregation, there was an elderly man uh, who uh, lost his eyesight and became so frail that he had to leave Newport and move to Boston in order to be close to his daughter who would take care of him. But he uh, missed his Baptist congregation in Newport and so he wrote a letter uh, to the pastor uh, and asked John Clark to come and bring communion to him. And so John Clark uh, gathered up two of his deacons, John Crandall and Obadiah Holmes, and they traveled to Boston. But John Clark was not satisfied with just serving communion to his parishioner. No, he invited the neighbors in. He preached to them the gospel. He taught them uh, the importance of believers' baptism. Many were converted and were baptized, and he conducted the Lord's Supper among this group. Well, uh, this activity came to the attention of the Congregationalist authorities, and so they came and arrested uh, these three, uh, John Clark, John Crandall, and Obadiah Holmes. They were preaching without a license. They were conducting the baptism and Lord's Supper unlawfully. Now, uh, John Clark and John Crandall uh, had their fines paid by uh, someone else. But Obadiah Holmes refused to allow anyone to pay his fine, and so he took the punishment. He was taken out into public, he was uh, tied up in the stocks, and he was whipped nearly to death. Um, he was whipped 30 times with the triple corded whip. Uh, Obadiah Holmes did not cry out, but when it was done, he merely said, you have struck me 
with roses. All right, but this was an exaggeration. He was, uh, he was wounded severely, so badly that he had to remain in Boston for several weeks while he healed. He could sleep only on his knees and elbows, and his back was permanently scarred. In 1652, he succeeded John Clark as the pastor of the Newport Baptist Church. And so Obadiah Holmes is a Baptist hero of the faith, uh, suffering persecution even here on the North American continent. In the aftermath of this persecution, John Clark contributed his own plea for religious liberty with his treatise titled Ill News from New England. When in prison, uh, Clark had uh, requested a debate with the local pastor, but of course uh, he was turned down. And so he used the opportunity of this treatise uh, to compose a defense of the Baptist faith. First, he described the arrests and the beating of Holmes. He raised concerns in England over Puritan persecution in America. And in his apologetic for Baptist faith and practice, he said, Christ is Lord over every aspect of life. Baptism is only for believers. He advocated for the right of all believers to speak about faith and said that religious liberty is a God-given right. And so we see that in uh, New England, the Massachusetts Bay Colony is dominant, uh, and they have taken their religious liberty and applied it only to their own church, uh, oppressing and suppressing any dissent. Uh, then leading dissent comes from the Baptist uh, church uh, that settles largely in Rhode Island, but we're going to see Baptists then spreading throughout America and facing um, persecution elsewhere. Let's go from New England to the southern colonies and examine what's going on there. Well, even earlier than uh, Massachusetts Bay, even earlier than Plymouth Plantation, Jamestown was settled in Virginia in 1607. It was the first permanent Baptist settlement. Now, whereas in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Congregationalism was the established church, in the South, the Church of England was strong. And so uh, in the Southern colonies, uh, the established church was the Anglican Church in Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. Now, further inland, Presbyterians and Baptists gained strength um, as settlements moved beyond the reach of the uh, Anglican authorities. Now in Maryland, uh, Charles I of England granted this colony to Cecil Calvert, Lord Baltimore. All right. Now, obviously this is where the name of the state capital comes from, named for uh, Lord Baltimore. It became a haven for English Catholics. This is not to suggest that only Catholics lived in Maryland, but uh, in Maryland Catholics were allowed uh, toleration for the practice of their faith. This was important uh, because Catholics would have been persecuted elsewhere in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and in the South. In 1649, the Act Concerning Religion outlawed persecution of any religion. And so in Maryland, we have religious toleration. It was actively practiced as a means of guaranteeing freedom for Catholics. But in guaranteeing Catholics uh, freedom, they also guaranteed the freedom of all faiths. So very important, we're beginning to see the development of uh, religious toleration uh, in the colonies. 
This continues in the middle colonies. For example, in New York, uh, the Dutch Reformed Church initially uh, was strong uh, and they granted religious freedom. But when the English gained control of the area in 1664, part of the deal was that uh, the English would have to allow religious toleration. And of course, this expanded after the Act of Toleration in 1689. The toleration enacted in England uh, was intended to uh, uh, function also in the English colonies. Now, Pennsylvania, 1681, founded by William Penn. All right, this Penn's Woods is uh, literally the name of, uh, of this colony. And William Penn founded uh, this colony for Quakers, but again, allowed the toleration of other groups as well. So around 1710, Swiss Mennonites arrived seeking religious toleration after uh, uh, decades of persecution in Europe. And they settled in Lancaster County. They still are there uh, as the Amish community. Philadelphia also became a center of Baptist life. Huh. I'm going to tell you a story about Elias Keach, one of the Pennsylvania Baptists. Back in England, one of the most famous Baptist preachers was Benjamin Keach. Uh, just for example, he was uh, the preacher who uh, encouraged the singing of hymns in church. But his son, Elias, uh, was a typical preacher's kid. That is, uh, mischievous, a troublemaker, a little bit loud. Uh, and uh, he arrived in Pennepec, Pennsylvania and walked around about town in clerical garb, uh, flamboyantly pretending to be a preacher. Well, it kind of backfired on him because the local church invited him to come to preach. After all, he was the son of Benjamin Keach. All right, well, Elias Keach was not daunted because he'd heard his father preach many sermons, so he just pulled one out, dusted it off, and uh, stood up in the pulpit and began to preach. Now, while he was preaching this sermon and he began listening to his own words and the text from the scripture, he fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He began to weep in front of the congregation who was confused about what's going on. But he confessed that he was an imposter and ran from the church. Well, then he found a Baptist pastor down in Cold Springs, Pennsylvania, and this pastor led him to faith in Jesus. He baptized him, he discipled him, he ordained him, and he sent him back to the Pinnepec Baptist Church where he became the pastor. Well, that's not all. The Pinnepec Baptist Church uh, began sending out church planters and became the mother church of the Philadelphia Baptist Association, which was an important Baptist association among early Baptists. The Philadelphia uh, Confession of Faith was very significant. So the story of Elias Keach, who was converted under his own preaching. All right, well, let's uh, close with some distinctives of early American Christianity. Uh, and as usual, when you see a list like this, you know you need to learn uh, two or three of these. And so one distinctive is that early American Christianity was largely English. The original 13 colonies were settled by the English who infused their traditions into American culture. All right, early American Christianity was Protestant. Many believed that God had saved the discovery of America until the advent of Protestantism. American Christianity was diverse because the colonies attracted a wide variety of religious beliefs. We've already talked about the Congregationalists, Baptists, uh, the, uh, the Church of England, uh, um, and Catholics. Well, there were also Jews and others. 
uh, that were present and so we have a wide variety of religious beliefs and more and more uh, toleration was granted especially in the middle colonies and this became an economic boon because more colonists would come to America to find uh, the, uh, the religious toleration that uh, they did not have in Europe. There was a greater dependence on the laity. Uh, the Reformation itself had emphasized the priesthood of believers, that each, each believer had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and so uh, these lay people began to uh, express their own spiritual values. Now, in the South particularly, as uh, laymen became property owners, uh, especially among the uh, Church of England, these Anglican uh, lay people, landowners, um, began to take more leadership. And then in the frontiers, as the, uh, uh, as the settlers moved inland, the frontiers required the use of laity. There simply were not enough ordained uh, pastors to meet the needs. There were large unchurched populations uh, because people were not being forced to go to church. Uh, the lower classes that had settled in the New World typically had not gone to church in England. The hardships of the frontier competed for time. And so, uh, especially in the frontier, uh, but even on the eastern seaboard, uh, there were needs for uh, the spiritual life, for evangelism, for discipleship. And so this led to concerted efforts, I'm sorry, concerted efforts to reach them, which led to revivalism. Revivalism then will be the topic of our next lecture as we see uh, the, spiritual, uh, the spiritual life decline uh, in the colonies, the need for revival grows, and God is going to provide. And we're going to enjoy talking about the first great awakening as we gather next time. Bye-bye for now.